Live is on on my side. Awesome. Thanks, Gina. Okay, I'm going to pull up our PowerPoint. We're going to go ahead and get started. Okay, so welcome everyone to our webinar Wednesday, which is part of our uh, cancer aware or cervical cancer awareness month series. Um, our topic for today is just the facts HPV vaccine for cancer prevention. Um, just a few notes, please mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Uh, this is being streamed live to Facebook. And uh, so just be aware and feel free to turn off your camera if you'd like. Um, and if you have any questions throughout the presentation, uh, please type them into the chat box as we go and I'll make sure that I'm monitoring that. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by the University of Chicago Comprehensive Cancer Center's Office of Community Engagement and Cancer Health Equity. Uh, we work within the Cancer Center with our cancer researchers um, and our, our cancer expert physicians, like the ones you're going to hear from today, to bring cancer education uh, both to our UChicago community and our greater Chicago community. Um, so we have a brief agenda for today. We have um, two speakers, uh, Dr. Katherine Kernett and Dr. Josephine Kim, who are OBGYNs here at the University of Chicago. Um, Dr. Kernett will be speaking first. Um, and after our speakers present, we will um, have a brief session evaluation and of course some raffle prizes at the end. So please stick around for those. Um, and with that, I'm going to throw it to Dr. Kernett. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that she can share hers. Excellent. Let me get this set up here. All right. Is that the right view? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Um, all right. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Carnett. I'm one of the GYN oncologists at the University of Chicago. So I did training in OBGYN, but then I went on and did additional training for um, cancer for women with gynecologic cancers. Um, so I mostly see cancer patients and sort of some of the pre-cancers as well. Um, but that's sort of my um, interest in this is also from the cervical cancer and seeing, you know, kind of how serious that can be and trying to help find ways that we can prevent it from getting there. So um, Dr. Kim is going to talk more about the HPV vaccine. I was just going to start us off by talking about sort of cervical cancer screening algorithms. Um, I want to leave this open and kind of like if you guys want to dialogue, if you have questions, I, I really want to make this um, interactive if that would help you. I want you all to have your questions answered. So I'm going to go through what I have, but please feel free to stop me and we can go on tangents if needed. Um, I have no disclosures. So the objectives for this um, first talk is to review some of the terminology that um, is important for cervical cancer screening, but also I hope to empower you all that when you're, you know, even if you don't have a medical background per se, that when you're seeing your doctors, you can understand what they're talking about and kind of know what you should be looking out for too. And part of that is understanding the language. Um, review some of the screening recommendations and algorithms, and then review um, colposcopy guidelines that kind of talk a little bit about what colposcopy even means. So I'm gonna start by just talking a minute about cervical cancer, like this is our big picture, and then we're gonna kind of bring it back in. But if you look at cervical cancer, um, you know, in 2020, they projected about 14,000 new cases and about 4,300 deaths. And those numbers aren't that high when you're thinking about breast cancer, endometrial cancer, other cancers. But the reason that um, it's still really important is that, um, and this is from a, a document that kind of comes out every year, um, cervical cancer continues to be the second leading cause of cancer death in women aged 20 to 39 causing 10 premature deaths per week in this age group. So the real point here is that um, although cervical cancer numbers aren't that high, the women it impacts tend to be younger. And in my mind, this is one of the like things that we really need to be focusing on because it's preventable. Um, and once you get diagnosed with cervical cancer, in a lot of cases, it's a lot harder to cure and to treat. But prevention is sort of where I think we're going to make the most gains. So I'm going to just take a minute and talk about anatomy. Many of you already know this, but I just want to make sure that we um, cover this because I think that there is, it's sort of like a, a black box when you go to your gynecologist, you don't really know exactly what they might be um, looking for or evaluating. So this is sort of, if you were to cut someone up and down looking in, this is a uterus, these are ovaries, tubes, 
And then down at the bottom of the uterus is the cervix. So the cervix is actually part of the uterus. It's just the bottom part of it. And it sits at the top of the vagina. So this is sort of outside. And then this is, I guess, what you would call like the birth canal. This is where our pregnancy would be. And it would come kind of when the cervix, it cervix opens and then delivers through. So when a gynecologist is actually doing a pap smear or a pelvic exam, what they're doing is looking in the vagina to look at the cervix. They're looking at it straight on. And that's sort of where um, the, you know, cervical cancer screening starts. So for this talk, the most important part, so this part at the bottom of the uterus, this is the cervix here, and then the, the vagina, which sometimes HPV can also impact. All right, so a little bit more about definitions. Um, when your doctor says a pap test or a pap smear, what they're referring to is cytology, um, which is um, basically taking a brush or a spatula and just kind of brushing the top of the cervix. So you're not actually pinching anything or cutting anything, you're just brushing it. You're basically just picking up the loose cells that are there. So like, just like if you were to do an exfoliation on your hands, you're getting all the stuff that's gonna come off really easily. That's what a pap smear is. So they're just taking a brush, they're twisting it in there and they're getting some cells, they're putting that in a container and then they're sending that off. And then the pathologist spins it down and they look at it on a slide, but it's just sort of cell, 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 cell. It's not like a structured thing in front of them. The next kind of layer after that would be a colposcopy. If you hear that, what that means, literally colpo sort of means cervix and scope or scopy is looking. So what they're doing in a colposcopy is literally just looking at the cervix. And this is done in a, in a gynecologist's office um, or sometimes in a PCP's office. And they're taking that speculum and they have a camera or they have a microscope and they're looking at your cervix just visually with their eyes. And we use acetic acid or vinegar and we use this camera. And what we found is that um, abnormal cells, so precancerous cells, will show up and look a little bit different. They'll look actually a little bit white. Um, and it gives us a sense of, first of all, what it looks like, but also it gives us an idea of where we should really focus our attention. So this is the outside of the cervix. We talked about like it was a, maybe a couple centimeters deep. It's just the very outside of it. Next is kind of a biopsy. So a biopsy means an actual bite of tissue. So it's a pinch or a cut. Um, and this is different than a pap smear, which is just that brush where they just took those cells. This is an actual pinch of tissue that they take and they put in a little container and they send it to the pathologist. And the pathologist gets a little pinch of tissue kind of in the way that it was cut out and they're able to look at it. And it gives us a much, much more um, kind of structured idea of what's going on. And this gives us more information because you have more tissue there. Biopsies are a little bit more uncomfortable. They are a little bit more involved, although still very straightforward, but they're usually done during a colposcopy. So they're looking, they're looking at that cervix, they're seeing the areas that look abnormal, and then they take a bite of tissue at the spot that they're concerned about. And then the last kind of word that I think is important is dysplasia. And this is basically a diagnosis that comes from a biopsy for all intents and purposes. Once you take that bite of tissue, the pathologist looks at it. And if there are cells that are precancerous, so they're not cancer now, but if left unattended, they will eventually probably progress to cancer in many, in many circumstances. Um, this is called dysplasia. So dysplasia is precancer, usually on a biopsy. Okay. So I'm gonna go through a very general algorithm just so you can see how this fits together. There are nuances here and literally like long, long, long documents about what the actual algorithms are, but this is sort of a broad overview. So you go to your gynecologist, you say, I'm due for a pap smear. Um, and so you go in and you get a pap test by your gynecologist. The pap test takes a week to come back. They look at those cells under the microscope and they say it's normal, great, or they say it's abnormal. And most of the time, if it's abnormal, then you get to say, okay, I have to go back, and now I have to do that colposcopy, look at it under the microscope with the vinegar. And then if there's something abnormal, at that same time, your gynecologist may say, you know, I'm gonna take a, a, a biopsy, I'm gonna take a pinch of tissue so that I can get a better evaluation. And this can be done on the outside, the part they can see, or they can do a scraping on the inside, which is called an endocervical keratosh, but it's all done in the office. And then if that biopsy is abnormal, then you have to, now you're kind of, if you get, let's say a pre-cancer back, then you have to decide what's my next step. And this is a more, these are usually procedures of some sort to either remove the abnormal area or remove the whole organ. You know, there's various different things that this can need, but you're basically using that biopsy to figure out what your next treatment step is. And then all of this information, once you go down this algorithm, at the end of it, you have a, some sort of conclusion and they say, okay, based on this result, you're gonna come back in 
six months or one year or five years, and you're going to do that pap test again because it usually does circle back to the pap test. Okay, so when we talk about how often you should get pap tests, this has really um, been a moving target. This is something that has been in flux, and I think it's made a lot of women confused. It's made a lot of doctors and nurses confused as well, but it's also made it very confusing for patients. Um, basically, different organizations will recommend different sort of screening guidelines um, to some degree, but all of these probably within the last 10 or so years fairly drastically changed. So women who are, who've been getting pap tests for 50 years, all of a sudden in the last 10 years, they were told something completely different and this has made it really difficult. So these are different organizations. None of these are particularly important for you all, but all this is to say that as an OBGYN, as a gynecologic oncologist, I tend to follow these ACOG guidelines because that's my big governing body. But primary care doctors may more often follow the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, which is slightly different, and some other folks might use, like, I guess sometimes I use the ASCCP or colposcopy organizations. As long as they're following one of the general large organizations, it's fine. It's the people who completely fall off these algorithms and just do kind of non-standard follow-ups. That's when I get a little bit more nervous. But just this is just to say that if you see, depending on who you see, they may recommend a slightly different algorithm, and that's okay. Um, that's basically what that says. So PAP test guidelines. This is what ACOG says. So again, my um, governing body um, says that below 21, you no longer need PAP test. So teenage girls um, no longer, you know, having a pelvic exam is separate than having a PAP test, but actually taking that brush and taking those cells no longer indicated for all intents and purposes below the age of 21. And there's a long discussion about why that change happened, but the biggest reason is because there are downsides to screening, like there can be interventions that can cause problems, and the risk of developing um, a, a, a cancer basically below 21 is incredibly low. So 21 to 29, ACOG says you actually just do that brushing part of it, and then you can sometimes use HPV testing after it. But for women age 30 to 65, I say with an asterisk, it were, till 65, you do both the pap test, the brush, and then you also send that fluid and check it for HPV or the human papillomavirus, which you'll hear a little bit about in, a, in the like next one. Um, but it's basically the virus that causes a lot of these precancerous changes, and so it's important to whether or not you have these. Um, there is a big movement, or there's, a, there's been a lot of changes about just doing the HPV testing and not doing those brushings, um, but that is kind of a, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, there are exceptions for women who have had a history of abnormal pap smears or cervical dysplasia or cancers or women with other immunosuppressing, other like compromised states, they may need to be screened more often, This, but this is for your general average risk women. So when do we stop? Basically, they say you can stop at 65 if you've never had a bad, really, really severely abnormal pap smear and if you've had normal screening for 10 years, and that after a hysterectomy, if the cervix was removed, a total hysterectomy, then you can stop if everything's been normal. Now, there are a lot of caveats to that, but in general, basically, if you don't have a cervix, you don't really need a pap test. Um, that is different. You know, some of the other guidelines have different recommendations. So some people say, or some guidelines say, really you should keep going after 65 if the patient and you have a discussion and kind of a shared decision making. But for um, the most recent bulletin, they say that you can stop at 65. So what about just doing the HPV alone? So still doing those brushings, but not looking at the cells and just looking at the HPV. So in 2018, everything got a little bit more complicated because the US Preventative Services Task Force, not ACOG, but this other group, came out and they basically said that you actually have a couple different recommendations, a couple different algorithms that you can follow. So you can screen with just the cytology alone, just do those brushings. You can, every five years, you know, for average risk women, you can do the brushings and the HPV together. And then there is a last kind of caveat here that every five years, you can also just do this HPV testing. So no longer looking at those brushing cells under the microscope, just doing the HPV testing. And that is something that ACOG has not yet adopted, um, but probably will, and I think it's in flux. So I, I'm not yet doing that because you need certain, like, you know, there, there are other things you need to consider with that, but it is something that you may be offered in the, you know, with your doctors, and that's totally fine. So what about um, PAP results? You get, you have your PAP test, your doctor calls you in a week, and they give you the results. Basically, they have two parts. So it's the cytology of those brushings, and then you have the HPV part of it. Most of the time, once you hit 30, you're going to have both of those parts. 
So what are your options? So they could say, everything is normal. Great. Or they could say, it looks normal, the cells looked normal, but you had this HPV that was present, and that makes me a little bit more worried. You can have this, the cells themselves look abnormal. Those brushings, they looked under the microscope, and they showed low-grade changes or high-grade changes, less aggressive changes or more aggressive changes. They can see those under the microscope um, with the cytology. And then you've got this kind of weird bag of results that are kind of not very settling because you don't quite know what to do with them. So there's basically something is abnormal, something is atypical, but we don't quite know what it is and we don't know why. It's just something isn't quite right. And so you've got this ASCUS, you've got ASCH, which is like ASCUS, I don't know what's wrong, but ASCH is, I don't know what's wrong, but it looks concerning for something very aggressive and worrisome. And then you've got this AGC, which we won't get into, but it's basically the glands the inside of the cervix or the uterus looks abnormal instead of the outside of the cervix that is where most of these things are found. And then every once in a while, you'll get a pap test that will show cancer. That is pretty rare, and we don't usually just rely on a pap test for that, but every once in a while, that might come back on there, um, and so technically, it is an option. Okay, so that was um, pap test, and now I'm going to shift gears a little bit to colposcopy. This is a little bit more kind of involved that you probably need to know, but I do just want you all to know that these things are out there and just kind of have heard the terminology. And this is basically what happens after you have a pap test and it shows one of these, um, one of these other things. It showed H-cell or it showed ASCH or cancer. Some of these different combinations of results, they say, oh, it looks abnormal. Now we have to do this colposcopy, okay? So you get your pap test, you get your colposcopy, they look under the microscope, you get your biopsy where they take that pinch of tissue and then this is where the dysplasia comes in. So they took that biopsy and it showed abnormal cells in the structured piece that they removed. And you basically, the other, like the way that you might see dysplasia written is CIN1, CIN2, CIN3. This is more of a low grade, less aggressive, less concerning. This is a higher grade, more aggressive, more concerning. This is closer to becoming cancer than this is. It's sort of like a a progression where it goes CIN1, then if it's left, left unchecked, it goes to CIN2 and CIN3. It's sort of a, in some ways, a relatively predictable process, okay? So there are totally different dysplasia guidelines, um, and I think this is where a lot of doctors, um, there tends to be some variation in practice. We're supposed to be all following these guidelines. Like, that is really what all of us should be using, and so these are available. Um, these were recently revamped, which means a lot of us are, like, they were just revamped in 2020, um, but the old ones in 2014 is what a lot of people are still using. So in 2020, we got new guidelines. Um, and it was published in a big paper, and a lot of really famous people are on this, and this is sort of what we are now all using. Um, they basically changed a few things in terms of conceptually, um, how we go about colposcopies and interpret results and how we kind of screen. But for the intent, from the perspective of a patient, it really hasn't changed too much in terms of general algorithms. So some of the updates you don't really need to um, kind of know too much about. The bottom line of all of these things is that um, we are now using your history, like it's no longer a snapshot. You don't come in, you get a pap test, and we say, based on this, you get this. It now kind of takes into account your history of abnormal pap tests or your history of dysplasia, and it uses that to figure out your risk of having dysplasia in the future. So it's good because it's smarter, but it's less good because it's um, less straightforward. It's not as transparent in some ways. Um, they, there's a lot of stuff that stayed the same that, again, doesn't really um, – you know, that you don't really need to know about the, but the bottom line is that basically people who have a certain risk should have the same treatment. That's what it comes down to is this should really be standardized. It shouldn't just be the doctor saying, eh, I'm kind of feeling like this is what you need right now. It should be a very kind of predictable um, progression, at least within the United States. Okay, so the new, um, in the last few minutes, the whole point of um, kind of dysplasia and pap test is to find CIN3, or that very high-grade, concerning-looking dysplasia, because we think that if we can catch it there, we can prevent it from becoming cancer. CIN3 is sort of like one step away from being cancer. And if you can treat it at CIN3, you have a very good chance at never getting cancer. But if you leave that unchecked, there is a fairly high probability that over some number of years, it eventually will become a cancer. And so this is all, all of these calculations and everything are trying to figure out our chances that you will, or like helping us calculate the risk that the patient in front of us is going to someday develop cancer. So 
there are, um, these are just the percentages that they sort of break down in terms of when you need to actually do something, but this is what your doctor should be theoretically thinking about. What's the likelihood that the patient in front of me has, is going to have cancer or CIN3 or worse within five years? And based on that, it gives you different follow-up plans. Okay. So this is sort of their algorithm in a fancy color-coded thing, but basically um, looking at the risk, seeing what the risk is, looking at um, the immediate risk, and then deciding, do you need um, to just come back in a year? Do you come back in three years? Do you come back in five years? Or do you need a colposcopy right now? Do you need to be treated? Like, do we need to take a bigger biopsy right now to potentially just treat this pre-cancer? Okay. So basically, this is really tough, and it becomes sort of one of those algorithms that is not very easy to use. And so the bottom line really is you can like, do you, we should really be using an app. And you, I just bought it back in 2020 um, because there's no way for me to download this Excel spreadsheet and do these intense calculations. And you can, anyone can download it. And you just go in, I think it's like $10, but lifetime access. You go in there and you say, I had, um, my PAP showed h cell this time. And last year it showed l cell, And I, my HPV was positive. And now I did a colposcopy. And it literally walks you through, you had this, and then they did this, and then that showed this, and then you do this. And it's very, it's actually very well delineated. Um, and although there's a lot of calculations behind the scenes that I may not know, at least I know what the next step is because it's very clear. Um, so this is for like, we would see a baby, a woman who comes in, she's 35, she's had all normal pap tests. Her pap here comes back normal, but the HPV is present. So her risk of having one of those CIN3 or concerning, um, you know, a, a precancerous that we're concerned about is about 5%. So this, if you plug it into the app, it recommend doing a colposcopy. Now, let's say that same woman comes in a year later. Now she's had normal paps but did have this HPV before. Her risk is now 15%. So it takes into account that she's had it for more than just this time. And it kind of carries it forward to give her her immediate risk. And it means that she still needs a colposcopy, but at least you can counsel her a little bit better. Say, you know, your risk is this and, you know, this is what I would recommend and this is why. So the bottom line is, these guidelines are very well delineated. They are accessible. They should be like visible to all doctors and nurses and healthcare staff, but also to patients. So I think this is a way that patients can be empowered too, that you can see what sort of the algorithms are. And if they're, if your doctor is not recommending or you think that you're due and they're not, you know, there, there are actual things that they can go through with you. Like they can pull it up and say, you're here on this algorithm and we need to go here. Um, so, my bottom line would be that every woman I tell my family, I tell my friends, I tell all my patients, you should know when your last pap test was, and you should know that result. Um, just because someone did a pelvic exam does not mean that they did a pap test. So you really need to know that they did an actual pap test and what that result was, because we know that one of the biggest reasons why women are still getting cervical cancer now is women who didn't get screened for whatever reason. You know, there are many reasons women don't get screened, but not getting screening is a really big risk factor for developing cervical cancer. So in summary, pap tests are a screening tool to look for cervical cancer. Um, there are really strict guidelines. We're supposed to follow them. This is not something that you get to just sort of like wishy-washy decide as you go. Um, there were new colposcopy guidelines in 2020, and pretty soon all of us should be used, like kind of caught up with that and using those. And these new guidelines are basically driven by your risk of having a uh, finding on your biopsy that's concerning a pre-cancer or a cancer that would be more kind of needing to be addressed. That's kind of what guides our whole principles around these tests. And there's an app um, that if you all are feeling motivated, you can look into. It is pretty easy. That's all I have. Um, I will gladly take any questions. You can reach out to me um, if you want to, if there's something you want clarified. Um, but I'm. Um, it was nice talking to you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Kernett. That was a really, really informative talk. Thank you so much again. I, uh, with the app, do you have the name of the app? Yep, it is. Um, I have it on my phone here. It is called ASCCP. Um, and when you do it, it sort of just looks like this and you just like plug in where all the different things are, but it's the letters ASCCP. If you type that in, it should be like, it should show up as being, um, you know, a, I think it's about $10 you can get in any of the app stores. Okay. Um, oh, and Dr. Lee just put that in the chat. You beat me to it. Awesome. 
Um, so, so that's in the chat box there, the name of that app. And I know that um, I'm definitely going to go back into my chart and look at my PAPS. You know, I, as someone who um, is, is not on the clinical side, a lot of us are not. Um, we don't necessarily take the time and go back and look at what our PAP test says and, and try to make sense of it. So thank you so much for, for all that great information. Um, are there any qu other questions for Dr. Kernit? Um, you can either unmute yourself and just ask or um, type them in the chat. I'm going to check Facebook really quick to just make sure we don't have any questions coming in on the comments there. It looks like we are okay. I would just second what Dr. Kernit said in terms of like knowing your own pap smear results, because I think that can be very particularly helpful. But also if you have new symptoms, such as bleeding or irregular discharge or something that's really changed, not to say, oh, but I had my pap smear like two years ago, so I should be fine. So just to kind of really make sure that like, you know, we kind of think of both ways um, in terms of um, really knowing the pap smear, but then also like if something doesn't, you know, seem right or there's new symptoms, don't just kind of like assume like, oh, I had my pap three years ago, so I'm sure everything's fine. I think that's the only other caveat to that that I would add. Yeah. Yeah, this really highlights the importance of, of taking your, your own health into your hands and, and making sure that you understand uh, what, what your physicians are, are saying to you. So thank you both for that. Yeah. Did you have something you wanted to add, Dr. Kernit, or? Nope. Okay. I didn't have a question. This is Gina. Hi, everybody. Um, that was a great presentation. I love the way you just had such a practical, this is this, and this means this, and this means that. And working in the community, that's the kind of stuff that community members want to hear. That's the kind of stuff that our um, community-based organization leaders, our, our community scientists, our popular opinion leaders, who just have like regular conversations. That's like really tangible information. I love that. And I think that, you know, we should put together like a small module or so, you know, I don't know, but it's just like a small module just for that. So just like the everyday person will know to do that. Cause like Aaliyah said, I never double check back and actually look at right. like the real, you know, nuts and bolts of it. It's just like, it came back fine. Yay. And I'm happy and I go about my way. So right. thank you so yeah. much. That was awesome. Of course. Yes. So empowering. Um, okay, great. If there are no other questions, and I don't see any here, um, I am going to throw it to Dr. Josephine Kim, who is one of our OBGYNs here at the University of Chicago. Um, Dr. Kim, I believe I've made you a co-host, so if you um, need to share your screen, you can go ahead and try that. Okay, great. Let me go ahead and pull this up. Dr. Kim's going to be speaking us uh, to us today more about the uh, the HPV vaccine and what it means for cervical cancer prevention. Okay, I think I've got the right screen here. Let's see. Do you guys see the title screen, the title yeah. slide? Okay, great. Perfect. All right. Um, so we're just going to go over some facts about HPV, the human papilloma virus, as well as the vaccine, um, which is amazing that there's a vaccine to actually prevent cancer now. So um, this is really exciting. And hopefully everyone will take away from this that it is um, a great invention and um, you know promoted amongst your family and friends. Um, I don't have any disclosures. So um, we'll review the current um, recommended vaccination guidelines from the CDC, um, as well as reviewing the data on the vaccine efficacy. And um, I put here not just dysplasia, because there's more recent data that it can actually help prevent cancer, not just the precancers and all the CIN 1 through 3 that Dr. Kernett was just discussing. Um, and then I did have a few more slides about COVID, but I just have a couple of summary things for um, the sake of time and just a couple of kind of summary points that the ACS has put out that I think are really important for us all to keep in mind just from the public health standpoint. Um, so what is human papillomavirus? So this is actually the most common sexually transmitted infection. And um, I think a lot of people don't realize this because it's not as much talked about and, you know, maybe doesn't come up as much in the discussion about the pap smear and how it leads to some of those changes on the pap smear screening that Dr. Kernett was discussing. So um, one of the problems with HPV and why it's so transmiss 
transmissible is that it's, um, you know, it can be transmitted just by um, skin to skin contact. So condoms, while are, they're protective against other sexually transmitted infections and probably to some extent the HPV virus, they're not 100% protective against this. And unfortunately, there's no actual treatment for the virus itself, which is why the vaccine has such an important um, implication. Um, so it's um, the highest prevalence of contracting HPV is within the first um, two to five years of initiation of sexual activity. And there's a second peak in the fourth and fifth decade. Um, most infections will be cleared in people that have a healthy immune system, um, but about 10% of infections are not cleared within two years. And in addition to that, older women are less likely to spontaneously clear HPV infections. And there are many different strains of the HPV virus. There's both what we consider low risk strains, which are sort of associated with things like genital warts and are less likely to lead to an actual cancer. And then there are high risk subtypes, which are we know are much more um, concerning for developing cancer. And um, it's really the persistent infections with the high risk subtypes that can lead to an HPV related cancer. So, um, you know, it's, it's not all HPV infections that will be very high risk for becoming a cancer or um, causing a cancer in the future. Um, so just to underscore again, HPV is extremely common. Nearly 80 million, million Americans are currently infected with HPV. And um, when we think about STIs, we tend to think a lot about gonorrhea and chlamydia as ones that are talked about frequently, but HPV is actually far more common. And just to visually represent, um, there are 14 million new infections of HPV every year compared with nearly 3 million chlamydia infections and just under a million gonorrhea infections. Um, so very, very common. And more than eight out of 10 sexually active men and women will be exposed to HPV at least once in their lifetime. Um, so as Dr. Kernan also mentioned, just to reiterate, there's, there's a process by which the HPV chronic infection can lead to these precancerous changes and eventually cancer, but there's a slow progression of that from, you know, there's a spectrum of CIN1 um, through CIN3, and we really consider the CIN3 lesion to be a, a true precancer where the risk of developing a cancer of left untreated is, is fairly substantial. And um, because of that slow progression, that's why the pap smear screening test is so effective and helpful because we, it gives us the opportunity to catch these lesions in an early stage when we can intervene. Um, so there are mathematical models that suggest that it takes on average almost five years for mild dysplasia to progress to severe dysplasia. And really the, the whole time frame from chronic HPV infection early dysplasia, moderate dysplasia, severe dysplasia, cancer, that whole process probably takes close to 20 years to develop. And so, um, you know, it gives us a lot of time, fortunately, in most cases to catch these things if people are being regularly screened for the guidelines. Um, um, and it's really the clinically, the clinically significant persistent infections are the ones that last at least two years. Um, we do know that there are some newer studies that suggest that the high-grade lesions can develop within a relatively short time frame after the initial infection, but in general, lesions that don't persist for at least two years are unlikely to have um, true clinical significance. Um, so this slide just shows the number of cancers that are attributable to HPV per year in the U.S. Um, in this time frame. And we know that HPV causes nearly all cervical cancers and many of um, the subset of vaginal cancers, vulvar cancers, penile cancer, anal cancer, as well as oropharyngeal cancer. And um, this data is from a CDC study that looked at tissue to estimate the percentage of these cancers that are probably caused by HPV. Um, and so, as you can see here, the CDC estimated that during this time frame, HPV caused close to 36,000 cancers in the U.S. per year, um, most of those in women and fewer in men. But the difference is that in females, the most common type of HPV-associated cancer is cervical cancer, whereas in men, the most common type is oropharyngeal cancer. And actually, oropharyngeal cancer has now overtaken um, cervical cancer is the most common cause um, of, of an HPV-associated cancer in the U.S. 
um, here just again underscoring the um, numbers where cervical cancer is the most common cancer in women that's HPV associated but it still only accounts for about half of the HPV associated female cancers and um, these other cancers vulvar cancer vaginal cancer we certainly see vaginal cancer is pretty rare um, but anal and oropharyngeal cancer also comprise um, a fair number um, and you know it un this slide just further underscores that over 30,000 cases each year um, of cancers are HPV associated and just the importance of highlighting that everybody getting the HPV vaccine um, is critical, not just to protect their partners, but also to protect themselves since men are also susceptible to these um, types of cancers. So why can't we just screen? Um, so I think this is kind of like a nice um, image that highlights some of the issues. So. The CDC calls cervical cancer sort of the tip of the iceberg, and this image just tries to depict a few different points that despite screening, there are still a large number of cervical cancer cases per year in the US and an even larger number of cervical precancers. And in addition to the six types of HPV related cancers, um, uh, sorry, among, among the six types of HPV related cancer, cervical cancer is really the only one that we have a good recommended screening test for where we can detect it at an early stage or as a precancer um, easily. The other types of HPV related cancers might not be detected until they cause serious health problems. So for example, as I mentioned, oropharyngeal or head and neck cancer is much more common than the other cancer types seen here, but it kind of falls into this unseen part of the iceberg, iceberg where we don't have a reliable screening method for this. So fortunately, with the development of the HPV vaccines, we can now prevent over 90% of these cancers. And we'll now get into some of the details about the vaccine itself and why on-time vaccination is important, as well as some of the safety and efficacy um, information we know about the vaccine. So um, there are three vaccines that have been approved over time. And um, right now in the US, the only one that is available is the Gardasil 9, which protects against the most um, number of the HPV um, virus strains that can lead to um, these different cancer types. So this was first approved in 2006 in the quadrivalent form where it covered four different virus strains. And then this was followed by a bivalent or um, you know two of the strains covered with the Cervarix vaccine. And then as I mentioned, the one that covers nine of the um, HPV strains is the Gardasil 9 initially approved for ages 9 through 26, and that approval was expanded in 2018 to cover ages 27 through 45, and we'll talk about some of the implications for that in a little bit. Um, so this table just summarizes the characteristics of the different HPV vaccines that I mentioned. Um, most importantly, you know, it just lists the different um, HPV subtypes that are covered by the different vaccines, and um, the most common that lead to cervical cancer are the um, high risk subtypes 6, 11, 16, 18. So those are all covered with the quadrivalent vaccine. And then the nine valent vaccine also added a, a few other high risk um, as well as low risk subtypes. So how does the vaccine work? Um, so the, the vaccine is made using something called virus-like particle technology. So um, this is, kind of fancy terminology where um, what's used is these sort of like not actual virus, but virus like particles that sort of um, resemble the conformation of the actual virus, but they're not infectious. So um, the scientists take a recombination of this, what's called an L1 capsid protein, which is basically kind of like um, uh, manipulated in the lab to form these empty shells that um, sort of by, um, I think it's like thermodynamic technology develops into these viral-like particles. And these basically serve as um, activators of the immune system to induce the production of a neutralizing antibody. And um, as I mentioned, since they don't contain the actual viral DNA itself, they're not infectious and they can't themselves cause cancer. So I think that's a really important point. Um, the body's response to the vaccine may be different than the one resulting from just a natural HPV infection. And actually what we've seen is that in um, patients who have an a natural infection, there's 
a, a um, local cellular response at the site of where the infection occurs, but the actual seroconversion where in the bloodstream um, immunity um, occurs is only about 60%. And the time to seroconversion is um, a little bit more delayed on average about 12 months. Um, and, in, and in general, the antibody titer is also lower in this setting, whereas with vaccination, um, there is a stronger response with seroconversion nearing 100% for the HPV subtypes that are included in the vaccine. And there's also significant cross protection for other low risk and high risk subtypes. So even though we know of the nine um, of the nine subtypes that can be covered using the vaccine, you may actually get protection from other subtypes as well um, just by getting the vaccine. Um, so I won't go into the details of these studies, but the, it's, I think it's just an, an important note that the approvals for these vaccines were based on several large studies that demonstrated that the vaccines are, are very effective. And um, the studies that led to the approvals all used um, CIN3 or like a, a dysplasia or sort of precancer as the endpoint for determining the efficacy of the vaccine. And the reason for doing that is because as I mentioned, the time frame from HPV infection to the development of cancer takes a very long time. So it would take too long to wait for cervical cancer to develop as an outcome um, to study it and its effectiveness in order to you know, get this into production and um, be administered to the general population in a timely fashion. Um, the studies were all done in um, Age, the age range of 15 to 26 year olds and females. Um, but since then, more studies have come out that makes it more applicable to a wider age range, which we'll talk about. Um, but as you can see here, um, in these several studies, efficacy has ranged from almost 90% up to 100%. So it is a very effective vaccine. And these are just a few of the other kind of key studies where we get more information and more approvals to fortunately cover um, a broader group of, of people. So top left here, this was a study that basically um, kind of bridged some of the information to be able to cover younger kids. So, um, you know, in kids, we don't use PAP tests. And so the way that we kind of in, um, inferred and um, gathered information about the response to the vaccine and these younger um, patients was doing blood testing for antibody titers. And what they found was that with the vaccine, the antibody titers in younger girls um, and boys was very robust. It was almost threefold higher in ages 10 to 15 year olds as compared with 16 to 23 year olds. And so this essentially permitted bridging of the efficacy data that we got from those other studies um, to allow approval for kids beginning at age nine. Um, the second study here um, led to the approval in men. So the endpoint that they use since, you know, as I mentioned, all these studies were using cervical dysplasia as an endpoint. This study used anogenital HPV infection and external genital lesions, including um, anogenital warts and kind of like an anal precancer um, in men to determine the efficacy here. And what they found was that the HPV vaccine reduced the incidence of these lesions in men. And so this led to the approval in males, which is very important because it helps decrease the transmission to females as well. Um, bottom left here is what led to the approval of um, the vaccine up through age 45. So in this study, they demonstrated that um, the vaccine was highly effective in women, even in women with evidence of prior exposure to HPV infection, but without active current infection. Um, and although the um, efficacy was not quite as high as we see in those, you know, in the younger age group, it was 66.9% overall and then reached 81% um, in the older age group. It did suggest that um, there is, there may be some benefit in um, patients even up through the age of 45. And then finally, um, this study in the bottom right led to a two-dose schedule being approved for children um, because we found that in that younger age range, they, they did have such a, a robust immune response that two doses was as effective or you know, not, not worse than three doses in the adolescent group. So this two-dose schedule is now approved for younger kids. So this is a summary of the um, 
guidelines from the CDC, and this is available on their website, and I like how they sort of break it up into who needs two doses and who needs three doses. And so they recommend um, routine vaccination in age, at ages 11 to 12 in boys and girls. This can start as early as age nine. As I mentioned, it's approved from age nine, but um, they kind of use this check mark um, on time vaccination in ages 11 to 12 to make sure that that's when, you know, people are really starting to get their um, children vaccinated. Um, and this should be done through the age of 26 if they're, they were not previously vaccinated. Um, they do recommend that in ages 27 to 45, there needs to be consideration of those most likely to benefit, which we'll discuss further. Um, basically, the two-dose regimen can be for um, young boys and girls if they start the series before their 15th birthday. Um, and the second dose should be six to 12 months after the first dose. And if the two doses are less than five months apart, they need three doses. Um, the three dose regimen can be used for 15 to 26 year olds um, or anyone that's immunocompromised. So on chronic steroids, um, have transplant patients, basically, oops, sorry, any situation where there's a compromise to the immune system, those patients should get three doses always. And this is given at um, the, the sort of zero time point and then in one to two months and then the third dose after six months. Um, as I mentioned, for ages 27 to 45, it's a little bit more complicated. So um, they, you know, the CDC recommends that there should be consideration and shared decision making about who is most likely to benefit. We feel that the public health benefit of the HPV vaccine in this age range is um, less robust and therefore, you know, not everybody might benefit as substantially from getting the vaccine. So, you know, people that I think it's very important to consider it for are adults who might be at risk of a new infection. So, you know, a life change where they have a new sexual partner, um, things like that. People are also living longer. So I think it is important to consider that fact that, you know, future life circumstances might change even though you might have had one monogamous partner for a long time. Um, you know, you might, you could get lifelong protection potentially, and no one can really predict what the future may hold. Um, there's really no clinical antibody test to determine immunity. So um, for that reason, the vaccine is um, maybe beneficial from that standpoint for certain patients. And then um, the uh, one important thing to consider is that if you already are infected or are, you know, in the process of finding out about all of this because you've had HPV on a pap smear or, um, you know, dysplasia, then um, that's probably not the best time to receive the vaccine. This is considered preventative. It doesn't actually treat HPV or prevent progression of a, of a current sort of precancerous or um, dysplastic lesion, if that's already been found. And, you know, one of the issues is that although it's approved by the FDA up through the age of 45, not all insurance companies will necessarily cover the cost of it through those age ranges. And so, the cost can be up to about $250 per dose. So that's another consideration that some patients, um, you know, it might be prohibitive and kind of weighing the risks and benefits, it may not, may not be worth sort of like those risks and financial costs um, in the setting of minimal benefit. Currently it's not recommended in pregnancy um, simply because it was not studied in that setting. And um, in immunocompromised patients, as I mentioned, three doses are always recommended. Um, so just a couple of other points. If the series is started um, and let's say a different vaccine becomes available for whatever reason you move, switch providers, and um, a different vaccine is what's offered at the new place, any licensed HPV vaccine can be used to complete the series on the same schedule. There's no maximum interval, so no need to repeat a dose if the schedule is interrupted, but there are some minimal intervals, which I mentioned, and these are, um, you know, readily available on the CDC website to um, look up and not need to commit to memory. There are a couple of contraindications to the vaccine. One um, obvious one is uh, anaphylaxis re reaction to a vaccine component or after a prior dose of the HPV vaccine. Um, there's also a contraindication if you have an anaphylactic allergy to latex with the bivalent vaccine because this is uh, made with a pre-filled syringe where the tip might contain um, a natural rubber, rubber latex. And then the four valent and nine valent vaccines are actually produced in baker's yeast. And so 
in patients who have a history of immediate hypersensitivity to yeast. This is contraindicated. Um, and then in anyone who has a moderate or severe acute illness, that there's a precaution to using the vaccine in this setting. Um, it can still be given, but they recommend deferring until the symptoms improved. But a minor acute illness is not a reason to defer the vaccine, and it can still be given. So that's like a mild cold, with or without a low-grade fever, diarrhea, things like that. Um, Safety-wise, the vaccines have shown um, excellent safety outcomes in the studies that were done. There have been no serious adverse events reported with any of the vaccines. And the most common reactions that have been noted are injection site reactions, which probably occur with every vaccine almost that um, is given. And a low grade temperature can occur um, in 10 to 30% of patients. Um, although in studies that were done, the, there was a similar proportion of placebo recipients that also reported a low grade elevated temperature. And then there are a variety of other sort of adverse reactions that you'll see listed on those vaccine information sheets that you get reported by vaccine recipients, and those are things like nausea, dizziness, um, you know, muscle aches. These, these are things that get reported, but in equal frequency to people in the trials that also got the placebo. So just important to keep in mind. Um, so thus far, we think that there's continued protection through at least 10 years after the vaccine. And we're going to kind of learn more over time as we get more um, long-term follow-up data about if there ever needs to be a, a booster or a revaccination necessary. But at this point, we think that um, there is not a booster that's needed. So how do we know if it's working? Um, so there are some data out there that show that since the routine recommendation um, happened in 2006 for females and in males since 2011, um, studies have shown a significant decline in the in the rate of HPV vaccine type, um, the vaccine type HPV infections, as well as these outcomes of uh, anogenital warts, as well as cervical precancers. So um, as you can see here, when comparing sort of infection rates in the post-vaccine era compared with before the vaccine, um, the rate significantly dropped. And there are um, also some newer data kind of looking at prevention of cancer itself. So, you know, thus far, all of the studies were mostly looking at the prevention of precancer and um, um, things like uh, anogenital warts and things like that. But we now have more and more data emerging that these vaccines actually may prevent cancer as well. So this was um, kind of a, a one of the earlier studies um, done in 2018, which looked at this was done in the US looking at kind of big population data um, about um, the incidence of cervical cancer before the vaccine was introduced and then in the most recent four years um, leading up to this study with information available. And they found that there was a 29% lower incidence or rate of um, cervical cancer in the, the era after the vaccine was introduced as compared with before. Um, so that's a pretty significant reduction. They did not see a significant decrease for ages 25 through 34, but this was really confounded by changes in our screening guidelines that were occurring during this time frame. Um, so this was kind of a, a um, earlier study that I think a, a lot of people thought there were just a lot of confounding variables to. And then more recently, last year, um, there was kind of a big registry data study that came out that just further supports that the vaccine actually can prevent cervical cancer itself. So, you know, it's hard to do like a big study where we kind of like randomize people to getting the vaccine or not and then seeing if they develop cancer because as I mentioned, there's like a long lead time before cancer develops and because there's such a low risk of cervical lesions after vaccination, um, it's difficult to conduct that type of study, which is sort of what we consider the gold standard for determining, you know, does this do what we want it to do? Um, so one way that we can look at this is looking just at like big numbers of population data um, through what's called registry data, which can look at the, the link between the HPV vaccine and the risk of developing invasive cancer. So in this study, this was done in Sweden, and they basically followed up females from the ages of 10 through 30 um, and um, looked at women who had not had prior HPV vaccination, and then um, they were sort of like 
followed if they did get the vaccine or not and at what age and then looked at for the development of cervical cancer. Um, so this was a really big study, including um, over half a million vaccinated patients, as well as um, over 1.1 million unvaccinated. And um, as you can see, there were very low numbers of cervical cancer cases reported. So in those that got the vaccine, there were only 19 who developed cervical cancer out of this 527,000. Two of them occurred if the um, patients were vaccinated before the age of 17, and then the remainder were if they were vaccinated between the ages of 17 and 30. So again, just reiterating, the younger that the vaccine is given, the more effective it is um, you know, prior to the onset of sexual activity, ideally. Whereas in the vaccinated, in, in, sorry, the unvaccinated group, there were 538 cases. Um, and this is just kind of a, a summary of their most important results, um, looking at sort of what they call this incidence rate ratio, basically comparing the rate that developed over time of cervical cancer in patients who got vaccinated as compared with those who, the rate of cervical cancer development in those who did not get the vaccine. And so, um, you know, I think these, these numbers can be difficult to sort of think like, what does that actually mean? But, you know, to underscore just when they kind of looked at some of the other variables that can play into, um, you know, risk factors for developing cervical cancer. So they looked at things like, um, the calendar year, the residential and parental characteristics, the um, socio kind of demographic factors going into both the mother and the, the family and the patient. And basically when they adjusted for some of those covariates, they found that the incidence rate ratio demonstrated was 0.12 if they got vaccinated in this ideal age range of less than 17. So what does that actually mean? Another way of saying that is the risk of cervical cancer in people who were vaccinated before they were 17 was 88% lower than in those who were never vaccinated. So a really substantial reduction. And you know, I think these curves just also underscore, um, you know, this flat green line is basically the risk of cervical cancer development in those who were vaccinated when they were young, very low versus, you know, the curve going way up for um, those who are unvaccinated after the age of 23, which is when cervical cancer screening starts in Sweden. Um, so I won't read through these, but these are the current indications for um, men and women or females and males um, for the HPV vaccine. And then I just have a couple of, sorry, I know I'm going a little over on time, but I just have a couple of slides um, just related to COVID. I think it is just kind of important to think about the public health implications of people not being able to come in as frequently for their preventative care visits and staying on time with routine vaccination. And I think this is this is just taken from a um, campaign flyer that the ACS put out promoting the HPV vaccine during the pandemic and some of the summary points. So, um, so you know, some of the implications are pretty severe that there has been a really significant drop in HPV vaccine orders by providers. Um, since the beginning of the pandemic. And the actual vaccination is also has also significantly dropped off, which is really quite sad because we were making um, very good progress improving vaccination uptake rates until COVID emerged. Um, and you know, even with that progress, we had not reached our real goal of, um, of vaccinating at least 80% of adolescents, um, although we were kind of approaching that before. And so, you know, in younger children, some of these wellness visits have recovered, but in, in um, preteens and teens, visits for vaccinations have not really recovered. So I think it's important to be aware of that, both as providers, as well as, you know, parents and, um, you know, family members of, of people, family, um, family members who have adolescents and young children to keep on top of these things. Um, that this really does remain a public health priority. And if we want to prevent these HPV related cancers that um, we do need to make the effort to do so. And you know, this I think um, kind of summarizes some of the key points as well that, as I mentioned, these are essential services. We need to consider them as such. And um, you know, I think it's important to ask your doctor, like what is your office doing to make sure that there's safety protocols in place? Like what is the best way that we can vaccinate and keep our kids vaccinated on time without risking needing to come into the clinic. A lot of the pediatric clinics I know are, are sort of separating um, sick and well visits so that, you know, there's a, for preventative care and wellness visits, those kids are 
coming in at a separate time, actually physically separating the spaces so that there's not um, interaction with those different groups of kids. Some places are also setting up things like um, um, uh, similar to like the the drive through COVID testing, you know, sort of drive up vaccine clinics so that you know they can be set up outdoors. There's um, no need to be in a place where there's a lot of people sitting around in a waiting room. And then I think um, you know one of the major things that has come up during COVID is some of these um, cancer, really healthcare related disparities. And we have certainly seen that um, HPV cancer disparities are definitely ev evident and. You know, we don't want to even further widen that gap um, as a result of the pandemic. Um, so, you know, ultimately, if we want to keep on track with being able to eliminate HPV related cancers, which should be feasible, um, we really need to start, um, we really need to stay on time and stay on track with getting the HPV vaccine as, you know, a public health priority. And so these are just some resources which um, I find really helpful for. Um, for you know, freely available to everybody, and just gives a really good um, background of, and as well as kind of like summarizing all of the current recommendations for the vaccine. So, in summary, the HPV vaccine is considered safe, effective, and durable. And we now have recent evidence that it can both prevent cervical cancer in addition to the precancers. Um, our vaccination rates were improving, but they're not quite at the goal that we want them to be. And COVID has significantly neg negatively impacted that. Um, and we definitely need strategies to make sure that we're getting our kids covered, getting our patients covered, um, family members, making sure routine vaccination is done safely and effectively. So that's all I have. Um, please feel free to email or reach out to any of us if you ever have questions. And I'm just gonna end the slideshow. I'm sorry, I couldn't see the chat while I was talking, so I'm not that's sure if anything came up. That is quite okay. Um, thank you so much again for, for all the great information there. Um, I'm sorry to everyone. I know we went a little over time, but I am I'm pleased with how much information we got. So that was really great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim, um, for, for giving us such a thorough explanation of why this vaccine is both safe and necessary. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop our live stream. Thank you to everyone who joined us on our Facebook Live. I'm gonna go ahead and stop that.